welcome to episode 53 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Maya Linda Butterworth, and today we hear how Amalek outsmarts his uncle's attempts to entrap him in part two of Amalek, Prince of Denmark. A friend of Feng, gifted more with assurance than judgment, declared that the unfathomable cunning of such a mind could not be detected by any vulgar plot. But the man's obstinacy was so great that it ought not to be assailed with any mild measures. There were many sides to his wiliness, and it ought not to be entrapped by any one method. Accordingly, said he, his own profounder acuteness had hit on a more delicate way, which was well fitted to be put in practice, and would effectually discover what they desired to know. Feng was purposely to absent himself, pretending affairs of great import. Amalith should be closeted alone with his mother and her chamber, but a man should first be commissioned to place himself in a concealed part of the room and listen heedfully to what they talked about. For if the son had any wits at all, he would not hesitate to speak out in front of his mother or fear to trust himself to the fidelity of her who bore him. The speaker loathed to seem readier to devise than to carry out the plot, zealously proffered himself as the agent of the eavesdropping. Feng rejoiced at the scheme and departed on pretense of a long journey. Now he who had given up this counsel repaired privily to the room where Amalith was shut up with his mother and lay down skulking in the straw. But Amalith had his antidote for the treachery. Afraid of being overheard by some eavesdropper, he at first resorted to his usual imbecile's ways and crowed like a noisy cock beating his arms together to mimic the flapping of wings. Then he mounted the straw and began to swing his body and jump again and again, wishing to try if aught lurked there in hiding. Feeling a lump beneath his feet, he drove his sword into the spot and impaled him who lay hid. Then he dragged him from his concealment and slew him. Then cutting his body into morsels, he seethed it in boiling water and flung it through the mouth of an open sewer for the swine to eat, bestrewing the stinking mire with his hapless limbs. Having this wise eluded the snare, he went back to the room. Then his mother set up a great wailing and began to lament her son's folly to his face. But he said, Most infamous of women, dost thou seek with such lying lamentations to hide thy most heavy guilt? Wantoning like a harlot, thou hast entered a wicked and abominable state of wedlock embracing with insatuous bosom thy husband's slayer, and wheedling with filthy lures of blandishment him who had slain the father of thy son. This, forsooth, is the way that the mares couple with the vanquishers of their mates, for brute beasts are naturally incited to pair indiscriminately, and it would seem that thou, like them, hast clean forgot thy first husband, as for me, not idly do I wear the mask of folly, for I doubt not that he who destroyed his brother will riot as ruthlessly and the blood of his kindred. Therefore, it is better to choose the garb of dullness than that of sense and to borrow some protection from a show of utter frenzy. Yet the passion to avenge my father still burns in my heart, but I am watching the chances. I await the fitting hour. There is a place for all things against so merciless and dark a spirit must be used the deeper devices of the mind. And thou, who hast been better employed in lamenting thine own disgrace, know it is suplicity to bewail my witlessness. Thou shouldest weep for the blemish in thine own mind, not for that in another's. On the rest, see thou keep silence. 
with such reproaches, he rent the heart of his mother and redeemed her to walk in the ways of virtue, teaching her to set the fires of the past above the seductions of the present. When Fang returned, nowhere could he find the man who had suggested the treacherous spile. He searched for him long and carefully, but none said they had seen him anywhere. Amleth, among others, was asked in jest if he had come on any trace of him, and replied that the man had gone to the sewers, but had fallen through its bottom and been stifled by the floods of filth, and that he had been devoured by the swine that came up upon that place. This speech was flouted by those who heard, for it seemed senseless, though really it expressly avowed the truth. Feng now suspected that his stepson was certainly full of guile, and desired to make way with him, but durst not do the deed for fear of the displeasure, not only of Amulet's grandsire, Rorik, but also of his own wife. So he thought that the king of Britain should be employed to slay him, so that another could do the deed, and he be able to feign innocence. Thus, desirous to hide his cruelty, he chose rather to besmirch his friend than to bring grace on his own head. Amaleth, on departing, gave secret orders to his mother to hang the hall with knotted tapestry, and to perform pretended obsequies for him a year thence promising that he would then return. Two retainers of Fang then accompanied him, bearing a letter graven on wood, a kind of letter enjoined the king of the Britons to put on the death of the youth who was sent over to him. While they were reposting, Amaleth searched their coffers, found the letter, and read the instructions therein whereupon he erased all the writings on the surface, substituted fresh characters, and so, changing the purport of the instructions, shifted his own doom upon his companions. Nor was he satisfied with removing from himself the sentence of death and passing the peril on to others, but added an entreaty that the king of Britain would grant his daughter in marriage to a youth of great judgment whom he was sending to him under this was falsely marked the signature of Fang. Now, when they reached Britain, the envoys went to the king and proffered him the letter which they supposed was an implement of destruction to one another, but which really beckoned token to themselves. The king dissembled the truth and entreated them hospitably and kindly. Then Amlet scouted all the splendor of the royal banquet, like the vulgar viands, and the abstaining very strangely rejected the plenteous feast, refraining from the drink even as from the banquet. All marveled that a youth and a foreigner should disdain the carefully cooked dainties of the royal board, and the luxurious banquet provided as if he were some peasant's relish. So, when the revel broke up, and the king was dismissing his friends to rest, he had a man sent into the sleeping room to listen secretly in order that he might hear the midnight conversations of his guests. Now, when Amalus' companions asked him why he had refrained from the feast of yester's eve, as if it were poison, he answered that the bread was flecked with blood and tainted, and there was a tang of iron in the liquor while the meats of the feast reeked of the stench of a human carcass and were infected by a kind of smack of the odor of the charnel. He further said that the king had the eyes of a slave and that the queen had in three ways shown the behavior of a bondmaid. This he reviled with insulting invective not so much the feast as its givers. And presently his companions taunting him with his old defects of wit, began to flout him with many saucy jeers, because he blamed and cavilled at seemly and worthy things, and because he attacked thus ignobly an illustrious king, and a lady of so refined a behavior bespattering with a shamefulness, abuse those who merited all praise. All this the king heard from his retainer, and declare that he who could say such things had either more than mortal wisdom or more than mortal folly, in these words fathoming the full depth of Amalus' penetration. 
Then he summoned his steward and asked him whence he had procured the bread. The steward declared that it had been made by the king's own baker. The king asked where the corn had grown of which it was made, and whether any sign was to be found of human carnage. The other answered that not far off was a field covered with the ancient bones of slaughtered men, and still bearing plainly all the signs of ancient carnage, and that he himself had planted his field with grain and springtide, thinking it would be more fruitful than the rest, and hoping for plenteous abundance. And so, for aught he knew, the bread had caught some evil savor from the bloodshed. The king, on hearing this, surmised that Amulet had spoken truth, and took the pains to learn also what had been the source of the lard. The other declared that his hogs had, though through negligence, strayed from keeping and battened on the rotten carcass of a robber, and that perchance their pork had thus come to have something of a corrupt smack. The king, finding that Amalus's judgment was right in this thing, also asked of what liquor the steward had mixed the drink. Hearing that it had been brewed of water and meal, he had the spot of the spring pointed out to him and set to digging down deep, and there he found rusted away several swords, the tang whereof, it was thought, had tainted the waters. Others related that Amleth blamed the drink because while quaffing it he had detected some bees that had fed in the paunch of a dead man, and that the taint which had formerly been imparted to the combs had reappeared in the taste. The king, seeing that Amleth had writing given the causes of the taste, he had found so faulty in learning that the ignoble eyes wherewith Amleth had reproached him concerning some stain upon his birth, had a secret interview with his mother, and asked her who his father had really been. She said she had submitted to no man but the king, but when threatened that he would have the truth out of her by trial, he was told that he was the offspring of a slave. By the evidence of the avowal thus extorted, he understood the whole mystery of the reproach upon his origin. Abashed as he was with the shame for his low estate, he was so ravished with the young man's cleverness that he asked him why he had aspersed the queen with the reproach that she had demeaned herself like a slave. But while resenting that the courtliness of his wife had been accused in the midnight gossip of a guest, he found that her mother had been a bondsmaid, for Amleth said he had noted in her three blemishes showing the demeanor of a slave. First, she had muffled her head in her mantle, as bondsmen do. Next, that she had gathered up her gown for walking, and thirdly, that she had just picked out with a splinter, and then chewed up the remnant of the food that stuck in the crevices between her teeth. Further, he mentioned that the king's mother had been brought into slavery from captivity, lest she should seem servile only in her habits, yet not in her birth. Then the king adored the wisdom of Amleth as though it were inspired, and gave him his daughter to wife, accepting his bare word as though it were a witness from the skies. Moreover, in order to fulfill the bidding of his friend, he hanged Amleth's companions on the morrow. Amleth, feigning offense, treated this piece of kindness as a grievance, and received from the king as compensation some gold, which he afterwards melted in a fire and secretly caused to be poured into some hollow sticks. When he had passed a whole year with the king, he obtained to make a journey, and returned to his own land, carrying away of all his princely wealth, and state only the sticks which held the gold. After these deeds in Denmark, he equipped three vessels lavishly, and went back to Britain to see his wife and her father. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.